Hi guys. Okay, we have arrived at chapter five of Peruvian Plunge, where we are uh, heading back to Atalaya, Peru. It is now Tuesday, May 26th, 2009. <clears throat> My final day with Marino at Dante's less than isolated jungle camp arrived under the same drizzly skies as the day before. After an almost routine breakfast of potatoes and coffee, Marino announced he had to go to the garden house to harvest a load of yucca, a stand a starchy potato-like tuber also known as manioc or cassava to flesh out his dwindling supply of potatoes. I wanted to go along on the adventure but had to stick around the lodge to await the boat that would take me on the two-minute trip back to Atalaya. The problem was I had no idea whether the boat was scheduled to arrive at 8 a.m. or 6 p.m. or any point in between. We had received news, otherwise known as a rumor, that two American women tourists would be arriving at some point during the day. It was this boat I planned to bum a ride from. I retreated to my hammock to wait out the day reading Amazon Stranger. Three false alarms <clears throat> later, well, uh, three false alarms later and some seven hours after I had laid down, the boat finally chugged into view and landed on the beach, disgorging three women, the two gringas and their gorgeous Peruvian tour guide, and two young Peruvian men the guide's assistants who proceeded to lug up the hill to the kitchen two five-gallon tanks of propane, two five-gallon jugs of drinking water, and a huge ice chest overflowing with no telling what delights to sustain the women for their two nights in the wilderness. I went down to, to the river to greet the touristas. The sour-faced younger of the two, an attractive blonde in her late twenties, was already scowling before her feet hit the sand. She seemed none too pleased to see me, but feigned friendliness just long enough to pick my brain about the place, particularly about its caretaker. In a sincere effort to help her out, I recap the story of Marino rifling through my pack and advised her to stash her valuables in the toe of a rubber boot. More than a little taken aback by this information, she barked at her guide, What kind of place have you brought me to? I assure you that this lodge is safe and that Marino will give you no trouble the guide stammered in fluid English, shooting me an eviscerating glance to shut the fuck up. Well, he better not, the young tourist huffed, and she and her quiet older friend stomped off up the steep stairway. So, the beautiful young guide hissed at me accusingly, you have been staying here with Marino? Let me guess, did he give you all that wild Indian crap about just leaving his village a few years ago? Don't believe one word that guy says. It was more like 20 years ago that some German anthropologist lived in his village. They made a film while they were there, and Marino was the primitive Indian they used to be the star of their movie. That film caused a lot of controversy and embarrassed a lot of people. It's been well hidden and nobody can find a copy of it today. Note to self, find that film no matter what it cost. 
with that amplification and clarification of the facts out of the way, the gorgeous guide trundled off after her charges to fix their snacks and drinks. My two-minute boat ride back to civilization would have to wait in another two hours while the two tourists were motored upriver in style and comfort to visit the garden house. I took the opportunity to chat up the two young male assistants as they scrubbed down the kitchen, hooked up the propane to the stove, and prepared lavish ham and cheese sandwiches for dinner. Ham? I had not tasted ham in the year 2009 and had not had one bite of animal protein since my chicken dinner five nights earlier. The friendly young man assured me that the 50-mile journey downstream to my next destination, if divided between bus and cargo boat, would be cheap, easy, and fairly straightforward, agreeing with both Dante and the naturopath from Lima I had met in Pilcapata. It was during this two-hour wait that Marino came trudging back to camp with his heavy burden of yucca, no doubt his dinner, as you can be sure he would not be invited to enjoy a ham sandwich. We said goodbye the same way we said hello three days earlier with a limp handshake and a few mumbled words. As the sun was already beginning to set, I hurried down the steep path with my bag of cannonballs before the boat left without me. I met the still sour-faced young ecotourista stepping off the boat just as I was stepping on. Listen, I stammered guiltily, when I was saying that stuff earlier about Marino, I wasn't insinuating he was a thief or anything like that. He's really a great guy. I just didn't want there to be any, uh, I don't know, miscommunication between you two. There won't be any miscommunication between me and that dude, she retorted back. If he lays his paws on my shit, I will personally beat the fuck out of him, and you had better believe he will never have another job in tourism again. She and her silent friend shouldered their way past me, not bothering to introduce themselves to Marino, who was coming down the path to greet the boat. Eco-tourism, the last great white hope to save the rainforest and its vanishing cultures. Yeah, right. <clears throat> the last glimpse I had of my peccary hunting, pagombi playing, Stone Age noble savage friend, he was standing glumly before the wildly gesticulating tour guide from Cusco, who was no doubt reading him the riot act that if he laid so much as one finger on anything belonging to the two gringa turistas, he had better believe he would never have a job in ecotourism again. Guiltily, I waved one last time from the prow of the departing, departing boat. Marino did not wave back. Epilogue. Two weeks after I left Dante's place, a crew of illegal loggers entered his private reserve, assumedly by boat, and laid waste to some 30 trees before being chased out by Marino. I have no clue what they wanted the second growth trees for. This is just one tiny example of the near impossibility of outsiders, even from as close as Cusco, protecting rainforests from the predation of illegal logging, mining, <clears throat> and squatting caretaker or no caretaker. Dante says he has reported the illegal harvest to the cops in Salvacion as if that is going to help those murdered trees on the hair-thin chance 
the cops do anything to catch the bastards. <clears throat> My interplanetary boat ride ended almost as soon as it had begun when I was deposited back on the eerily dark and quiet because the power had been off for two days boat dock in downtown Atalaya. I had barely had time to wrestle my bag of cannonballs out of the boat before I was pounced upon by the cat-like Ernesto, who apparently had not moved from the dock in the three days since I had left him there. In his trademark barrage of machine gun Spanish, he peppered me with questions about my three days in the wilderness. I told him I would fill him in with all the gory details later, but first I was long overdue for a shower and a meal with a dead animal as its center of attraction. <clears throat> I made this last announcement right as we were passing the same little restaurant where I had enjoyed my delicious chicken dinner. In the last vestiges of twilight, I managed to make out the words Plancha de Picuro scribbled onto the chalkboard menu of the day. I recognized plancha to mean something was being grilled that evening, but never had I encountered the word picuro, P-I-C-U-R-O, in all my years of traveling the backwaters of Latin America. I asked Ernesto what the word meant, but all he would say is that it was something that gringos don't eat. As hungry for meat as I was at that moment, I would have eaten pretty much anything with the exception of cow, dog, cat, monkey, or manatee. There ensued my game of 20 questions to figure out just what kind of mystery meat was being grilled at Atalaya's finest dining establishment some anonymous animal that no gringo would be foolish enough to put in his mouth. First, I had to eliminate my own five personal prohibitions, clear on all counts. Next, I eliminated all birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects, leaving me with mammals. As picuro sounded vaguely like peccary, I ran this by Ernesto, not peccary, not pig, not alpaca, not llama, or anything else with hooves. I asked Erne Ernesto how big this creature was, and he spread his arms out to indicate some animal about the size of your average Atalaya street dog. I pointed to one of the local mangy mutts, and he assured me, no, at a Spanish-English impasse, Ernesto tapped his two front teeth and made a gnawing noise. I immediately thought of all the squealing I had heard from the myriad of resonant rats living in the attic of Ernesto's hotel. You mean rat? I guessed wildly. See, sí, rata, Ernesto hooted. I held out my hands about three feet apart to confirm the size of this edible rat. See, sí, es muy grande. Es rico? I asked tentatively. Does it taste good? See, sí, es muy sabroso. He trumpeted, licking his fingers for effect. Okay, amigo, then rata grande it is, I responded with unconvincing feigned enthusiasm. Ernesto grinned from ear to ear. His evening's entertainment schedule was set. Tonight, he was going to get to watch a crazy gringo eat a giant rat for dinner. Listening to the rats crack up their evening fiesta in, or in Ernesto's attic as I stood shampooing my hair by candlelight in the cold water, it dawned on me that this giant rat was most likely a member of the guinea pig family, either an agouti, 
a, a paca or a capybara, judging by the animal size and buoyed by reports from other jungle explorers, I decided correctly, I confirmed later, that my giant rat was in fact a paca, a 30-pound tailless ground-dwelling spotted rodent that forged throughout the Amazon, planting Brazil nut trees along the way, and a source of meat prized by the local Indians for millennia. While the realization that my dinner did not have a naked scaly tail attached to its rear end made it more palatable, for some reason, to my civilized gringo sensibilities at the same time, the rainforest-saving environmentalist side of me assailed my consciousness. Even though Paca is only a lowly rodent, it nonetheless is emblematic of the truly evil bushmeat trade, whose mounting pile of carnage is decimating entire populations of rainforest mammals from Peru to New Guinea to the Congo. While pacas and hundreds of other species have been able to withstand the limited assault by primitive societies for millennia, the introduction of the shotgun in the last century and the massive intrusion of roads since the 1970s have so decimated so many species of animals that places like Thailand and Guatemala are little more than wastelands of former biological diversity. Even the not-so-politically guidebooks to the Amazon implore gringos not to eat any bushmeat. From the poverty-stricken hunter's perspective, if a gringo will eat a paca, there's no reason he shouldn't eat a monkey or a manatee as well. For me to refuse to eat beef, then turn around and eat a paca, would be a hypocritical act tantamount to Richard Nixon calling himself a Quaker. But, God damn it, I was hungry, and it was, after all, just a lowly rodent. And who knows, maybe it really was a giant rat from Ernesto's attic. And I had already bragged to Ernesto that I was going to eat the damn thing, and chicken wasn't on the menu. And the greatest rationalization of them all, the little fucker was already dead and sizzling on the grill, and if I didn't eat him, somebody else would. This selfish mode of thinking is, of course, the number one reason this planet is in the shape it's in today. It seemed like half of Atalaya had turned out for the festivities to watch the loco gringo take his first bite of giant rat. I guess the power outage had left their satellite TVs dark and their boom boxes mercifully silent, so I was the biggest show in town on a slow Tuesday night. Ernesto and I took a candlelit corner table with a river view and shared a cold 55-gallon drum of cerveza while our giant rat paca was sizzling on the grill. If my date had not been a grizzled bearded lunatic, it would have been positively romantic. The moment of truth finally arrived when the beefy proprietress emerged from the kitchen and ceremoniously preferred to me a steaming, juicy slab of some creature's hindquarters and back leg that vaguely resembled in the soft flicker of candlelight to be a turkey leg with a thigh attached. I noticed with a twinge of revulsion that the thumb-sized foot, complete with toes and toenails, was still attached. I conducted a brief forensic examination of the foot to, to determine that it was, in fact, not attached to a dog, a cat, 
or a monkey. It wasn't. My next challenge was to figure out how to eat the damn thing. Somehow this mound of scorched flesh before me did not invite the civilized niceties of knife and fork, but beckoned to a more primitive urge to pick it up with my hands and gnaw on it. The slab of meat weighed close to a pound. After twirling the cumbersome object around, I discovered that if I nestled my left thumb into the curve of the little ground dweller's paw pads with the help of its claws for balance, the food and the shin bone made a perfect handle to grasp. I tentatively nibbled along the narrow calf, but was met with the resistance of tendons. The broader expanse of flat thigh offered me no obvious point of purchase with my teeth. The only real point of access was the ragged rip along the animal's former groin. With a dozen set of Indian eyes staring at me in expectation, I took a large juicy bite out of the top of the rodent's ravaged thigh. My hungry mouth was filled with quite possibly the single sweetest, most delectable meat I have ever tasted. A smoky, savory blend of flesh and juices falling somewhere on the scale between baby back pork ribs and veal. No doubt partly due to my ravenous, protein-starved appetite, not to mention the culinary talents of the chef, it was, quite simply, the most enjoyable meal that I have eaten in the year 2009. My mouth is watering as I write these words, and I am already fantasizing about my future paca farm in Texas. Poor Ernesto, he had secretly been hoping I would spit it out and offer my plate to him. Right, dude. Price? Two bucks. My belly full of giant rat, I waddled back to my hotel room, relishing in the calm, quiet, and darkness of the powerless jungle town. No eagle's greatest hits disturbed my slumber that night as I dreamed of Amazonian adventures yet to come. And we will continue with my Amazonian adventures in chapter 6 as we head to salvation.